Conscious Power, Chapter 3, Subconscious Vital Processes. Among the most fundamental activities of the subconscious are those which are concerned with the vital processes of the physical body, the processes of life and the living organism. Although the fact is not generally recognized, it is an established scientific truth that the subconscious controls, directs, institutes, and conducts the vital processes of the body, which are concerned with growth, nourishment, and the general operation of the living organism. The operation of the vital processes manifested in every organ in your body is conducted by the subconscious. Every organ, every part, even every cell is under the control and direction of the subconscious. The work of repair, replacement, digestion, assimilation, and elimination, which is underway in your physical body, is performed by the subconscious. In short, your entire vital activity is under the control and direction of your subconscious, although your ordinary consciousness is not aware of this fact. Many persons, most persons in fact, if they think of the matter at all, are inclined to the general notion that the body runs itself like a machine, or rather like a clock that has been wound up and set going. So far is this from being a fact, however, that it may be stated that every action and movement in your internal organism, with the exception of the purely mechanical or chemical movements and changes, is affected by your will, the latter usually manifesting along the lines of subconscious activity. All the operations of the life forces in your body are found to result from mental action of some kind, usually subconscious mental action. It is an axiom of certain careful thinkers that all life action is mind action. In every vital process in the living organism are to be seen the presence and activity of mind in some form, some phase, and some degree. As Carpenter says, the convertibility of physical forces and the correlation of these with the vital forces and the intricacy of that nexus between mental and bodily activity, which cannot be analyzed, all lead upward to one and the same conclusion, that the source of all power is mind. Bacon says, life is not force, it is combining power. It is the product and presence of mind. Dunn says, from the first movement when the primordial cell germ of a human organism comes into being, the entire individual is present, fitted for human destiny. From the same moment, life and mind are never for an instant separated. Their union constitutes the essential work of our present existence. That all which is called vital force, the healing power of nature, or the vis medicatrix naturae, is but a form, phase, or aspect of subconscious mental action, of the work of the subconscious, cannot be doubted even for a moment by those who have carefully investigated nature's healing processes. These processes constitute what is known as the curative efforts of nature, or the vis vita, by which terms is indicated that certain curative or restorative principle of nature, which is implanted in every living organized body and which is constantly operative for its repair, preservation, health, and well being. Instances of the effective work of this great natural principle are seen in the respective processes manifest in cases where a finger or toe is lost by the man. Here, as a prominent medical authority has said, nature unaided will repair and fashion a stump equal to one at the hands of an eminent surgeon. Careful medical authorities have pointed out in their books and in their lectures the fact that undeniable mental action is present in the ordinary vital processes and functions. They assure us that no machine could be constructed, nor could any combination of solids and liquids in organic compounds serve to regulate, control, counteract, help, hinder, or arrange for the continual succession of different events, foods, surroundings, and conditions, which are constantly affecting the body. Under no mechanistic theory can satisfactorily be explained the fact that in the midst of such ever-changing and varying succession of influences, the body holds to its course of growth, health, nutrition, and self-maintenance with the most marvelous constancy. It is clear, say these authorities, that such qualities as regulation, control, etc., are mental qualities rather than mechanical properties. 
But they bid us note, it is equally clear that by no ordinary mental actions can we consciously exercise any of these mental powers over the organic processes of our bodies. The inevitable conclusion, they say, is that the mental powers which are seen to be operating in the body are exercised unconsciously, that our unconscious mental powers and nothing else control, guide, and govern the functions and organs of the body. As one of these authorities says, when thoroughly analyzed, the action and regulation of no part of the body can be satisfactorily explained without postulating an unconscious mental element, which does, if allowed, satisfactorily explain all the phenomena. We would call your attention here at this point to the fact that the bases of mind care, mental healing, mental therapeutics, or by whatever names the various systems of mental cure of disease may be called, undoubtedly are to be found in the fact that the vital functions and processes of the body are really performed by mind operating along subconscious mind, by the subconscious in fact. This being realized, it is seen plainly that mental healing in each or all of its forms is not a case of the power of mind over matter, but rather that of the influence of one phase of the mind over another phase, a case of mind over mind, in fact. The connective nerves or filaments which unite the cerebrospinal and the sympathetic nervous systems serve an important purpose in the work of mental healing, and their presence is very significant in the light of the phenomena of mental therapeutics or faith cures, and in the well-known ordinary phases of the effect of mental states upon physical functions. They serve to explain the vital mechanism employed in the production of these interesting classes of psychophysical phenomena. And likewise, they serve to furnish the physical explanation of the psychological processes operative in the phenomena of mental healing. That mental states produce reactions in the form of physical conditions is admitted by even the most conservative medical authorities. The most casual observer must have noted that the emotions of fear, grief, anger, worry, or joy have a most marked effect upon the physical processes of digestion, assimilation, and elimination. A change of mental state is almost immediately followed by a change in physical function. Your appetite is seriously affected by the receipt of bad news, while good news imparts a new zest to the enjoyment of your meal. The sight or the recollection of the sight of a disgusting object will produce nausea, or at least will spoil your appetite. The sight of the memory of appetizing food will cause your mouth to water and your gastric juices to flow more freely. The bad boy who stood in front of a brass band and by means of sucking a lemon induced the saliva to flow copiously from the mouths of the musicians, thus causing their playing to come to a sudden and disastrous end, understood the practical effect of this principle though doubtless ignorant of the real cause operating in the case. The practical joker who sets the company of persons to yawning as the result of the mental contagion produced by a simulated yawn understands how this principle works out in practice, though he may not realize the exact psychology or physical process involved. Experimental psychology has demonstrated that the circulation follows the attention and that by concentrated attention directed to any part of the body, one may increase the blood supply to that part. Thus, experiments have demonstrated that the blood may be sent in increased quantity to the hand or else withdrawn from it simply by means of concentrated attention accompanied by mental suggestion or auto-suggestion. The dark red color of the hand in one case and the pallid appearance of the hand in the other case being sufficient evidence of the soundness of the principle. Many practitioners of suggestive therapeutics who have experimented along these lines have held that the increased supply of nerve force accompanying the increased flow of blood sent to the several organs and parts of the body in this way plays a most important part in many cases of mental healing. Just as the flow of the blood to any part or organ of the body may be increased by concentrating the attention upon those parts and organs, so the movements, activities, and processes of the digestive organs, the organs of elimination, and even of the heart may be influenced by employment of the attention or by the presence of certain mental states 
which serve to accelerate or retard such processes as the case may be. Modern science admits that it is positively established that suggestion or autosuggestion can and does affect the so-called involuntary functions of the body. We shall see just how and why suggestion and autosuggestion produce these effects when we reach that particular phase of our subject a little further on in this section of the book. That the respective states of health and disease depend materially upon the character of the emotional states predominant in the subconscious mentality of the individual is now universally admitted in authoritative medical circles. Statements concerning this fact and examples and instances illustrating it are to be found on all sides in medical journals, textbooks, and class lectures. The following examples will suffice to illustrate the general character of the conclusions expressed in such statements concerning this matter. Dr. Southworth says, if mental states can change the various secretions of the body, making them poisonous, for example, the saliva and the milk in the human breast under the influence of anger, worry, or fear, could it not also be productive of disease through imperfect or non-elimination? Is it improbable that fear, which is a greater negative force than anger, may produce the results as indicated? Professor Elmer Gates says, my experiments show that irascible, malevolent, and depressing emotions generate in the system injurious compounds, some of which are extremely poisonous, also that agreeable, happy emotions generate chemical compounds of nutritious value, which stimulate the cells to generate energy. Dr. Borton, writing of the healing of the body through the mental forces in which unhealthy conditions are transformed into healthy, normal states, says, these changes are not miraculous, but proceed from natural causes in the operation of the mind as a therapeutic agency operating through the functions of the body, sometimes as a tonic or stimulant, warding off diseases under the most exposed conditions, defending and holding the system in a state of health. While those devoid of these mental assurances become victims to the ravages of disease through contagion or infection. This protective force of the mind has been demonstrated many times in hospitals and other places where contagious diseases were prevailing. The mental force possesses a protective power when rightly exercised far beyond what is usually conceded. This not only in the way of defense, but also in correcting diseases when in existence. The investigations of Freud and his school have served to throw new light upon many obscure mental causes of disease and abnormal physical conditions. The work of psychoanalysis is directed to a considerable extent to uncovering these causes which are hidden in the recesses of the subconscious. Briefly stated, the case is as follows. Many abnormal physical conditions and often chronic complaints have as their primary cause a disturbance of the emotional nature arising from past experiences of an unpleasant nature, such as, for instance, real or fancied slights, injuries, injustice, frustration, or cherished desires or similar occurrences in the past life of the individual. As the years pass by, the main facts of the actual event fade from the memory, and the individual seemingly adapts himself to the conditions forced upon him. But the subconscious has not forgotten these. Instead, their memories abide in the out-of-consciousness realms and work their evil effects. Like a hidden cancer, or like a great gnawing worm dwelling in the emotional nature of the person, the old sore persists and tends to poison his mental and physical constitution. Thus, old hates, old jealousies, old fears abide in the subconscious producing the physical reactions which are well known to psychotherapy. It is the work of the scientific psychoanalyst to dig out these cancerous mental growths or these psychic gnawing worms and to bring them once more into the field of consciousness. Once brought before the conscious attention, they may be examined, analyzed, dissected, passed upon, and discarded as having no real present importance. Thereupon, they are discharged from the mental realm once and for all by means of this cathartic process. The system is relieved of these hidden roots and causes of disease and in normal physical conditions and health and normal functioning once more is manifested. 
These and similar discoveries have served to add greatly to the efficiency of mental therapy and to broaden its field. They have verified the basic principles and theories of mind cure and indicate improved methods of applying them. In this consideration of the subconscious vital processes, we must call your attention to three very important facts. Namely one, that the subconscious is amenable to suggestion and auto-suggestion. Two, that the subconscious tends to accept as true the ideas and statements which the conscious mentality places or allows to be placed in it. Three, that the subconscious after accepting a suggestion or auto-suggestion proceeds to carry the suggested idea to its logical conclusion, irrespective of its actual truth, and thereafter will tend to manifest in physical states and functioning the mental state or completed idea, the seed of which has been supplied by the suggestion or auto-suggestion. Now, there is no need here for us to enter into a technical description of the psychology of suggestion. It is sufficient for our purpose to consider a suggestion as a seed idea, which is planted in the rich mental soil of the subconscious. An auto-suggestion is merely a suggestion made by one to himself. It is a case of, says I to myself, says I. A plain suggestion is a seed idea coming from an outside source, a statement from another person, a passage in a book or newspaper, a printed sign, the manner of another person, etc. All suggestion at the last is auto-suggestion, for the reason that the individual permitting a suggestion from outside to become lodged in his subconscious really tacitly endorses it and makes it his own, just as man endorsing a check or note assumes responsibility for the paper. The result of the suggestibility of the subconscious is quite marked in the case of the subconscious vital processes. Suggestions or auto-suggestion of health tend to produce conditions of health while suggestions or auto-suggestion of disease tend to produce conditions of disease. It has been said that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Equally true and for the same reason is the statement that as the subconscious thinks its owner's physical condition is or should be, so that physical condition actually becomes in time. By reason of these fundamental facts concerning the subconscious, it is easily seen how and why the seed ideas implanted in the soil of the subconscious eventually sprout, bear leaves, blossoms, and fruit of health or disease, as the case may be. By means of the planting of the seed ideas of feather thought, panicky feelings, mental pictures, and thoughts of diseased conditions, depressing and discouraging emotional states, coupled with the mental attitude of the expectant attention or confident expectation of the coming or the continuance of the physical disorder, the conscious mentality impairs and interferes with the normal action of the subconscious mental activities, quite frequently giving to them an entirely wrong direction or course of procedure. This wrong direction or course of procedure in time often becomes chronic and permanent unless removed or else neutralized by a reversal of the method which originally brought it about. On the other hand, by energizing, animating, and strengthening the subconscious mental processes by cheerful, happy, and hopeful states of mind concerning the physical condition, by inspiring emotional states and feelings by mental pictures of healthy, normal physical conditions rather than of the abnormal, there is aroused a strong natural power of resistance to diseased conditions, to impaired physical functioning, and to ill health in general, a strong recuperative energy tending to prevent disease in the first place, and in the second place to restore health when it has become impaired. Avoid as you would a pestilence, all depressing emotions and all negative mental states such as anger, fear, worry, jealousy, envy, and hatred. Also avoid with equal care all expectations or beliefs that you will contract disease, even when it is raging around and about you. Refuse to allow your imagination to be filled with the negative evil pictures of diseases or diseased conditions. Avoid or learn to resist and throw off the evil suggestions of others that you will contract disease or manifest diseased conditions. 
Shed these suggestions like the proverbial water from the duck's back when you cannot escape from the company of persons given to the planting of such pestilential seed thoughts. Cultivate the positive emotional states of fearlessness, calmness, poise, cheerfulness, hope, faith, confidence in the powers that be in nature or above and over nature. Form the habit of expecting and looking forward to the normal natural conditions of health, not to the state of disease. Trust the life forces in nature to pull you through, even when you may happen to slip. Fill your mind with the ideas and mental pictures of health and not of disease. Frequent the company of those who look forward, not backward, upward, not downward, and whose vision seeks the good rather than the evil aspects of life. Read books having this forward and upward outlook upon life. Above all, keep your mind filled with the bright, cheerful, and happy mental pictures of health and normal physical condition. Be careful to admit only the right kind of pictures to your mental picture gallery. Always see yourself as you wish to be, not as you fear that you may be. Keep ever before you the visualized ideal of health. This, no matter how much the existing condition may strive or tend to influence you in the opposite direction. This last is important for those ideal mental pictures of the patterns which the subconscious, which is really that which you have been thinking of as life or nature, employs in building your physical body and in weaving the fabric of your physical functioning and conditions. This is the great principle underlying all the various schools of mental healing, faith cure, etc., even of those schools which seek to veil their teaching in metaphysical and quasi-religious terminology and dogma. The development of the depressing negative mental weed spoils the mental garden of the subconscious and chokes the valuable plants which should be grown there. The act of holding before the imagination or the ideated faculties the mental picture of disease is bound in time to cause the subconscious to strive to manifest an objective physical reality, the conditions presented to it in such pictures. The confident expectation or expectant attention of diseased or abnormal physical conditions is practically certain to cause the subconscious to proceed in the direction of making the ideal become real. The statement of Job that, that which I feared hath come upon me, expresses an actual fact of physiological psychology or of the psychological physiology. This negative influence and condition so imparted permeates the organs and parts directly involved and the cells which compose those organs and parts as well. It also by reflex and sympathetic action and reaction of this kind, the action of the conscious mentality upon the subconscious and the reaction of the latter upon the former serves to break down the natural habits of resistance and self-protection with which the subconscious is endowed. As a result, chronic ill health frequently results. Here we have an actual example of the truth that to him who hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. In such cases, the only remedy is to halt the progress of the downward swing of the subconscious activity and to reverse the progress by transmuting the activity into an upward positive manifestation. The latter, however, is equally cumulative, the action and reaction proceeding in the direction of health, so that we have an actual example of the companion truth that to him who hath shall be given. The rule works both ways, as all good rules are said to do. Finally, you will do well to remember the old adage that that which will make a sick man well will keep a well man well. That which will cure disease will prevent disease. Therefore, you are strongly urged to acquire, cultivate, and maintain the positive, up-looking, forward-looking mental attitude, even in the days of your most perfect health. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You should determine to adhere faithfully to the ideal of health, to cultivate the habit of holding firmly to the mental pictures of health, and to be aware of allowing that ideal and those mental pictures to become weakened, dimmed, clouded, or hidden by adverse auto-suggestions on your own part or by the acceptance tacitly or actually 
of similar suggestions arising from the remarks, views, beliefs, or negative mental attitudes of other persons or from other sources. This then is the part played by your subconscious in the matter of the direction and control of your physical functions and processes. You have at your disposal the wondrous powers of the subconscious, which you may direct to the work of maintaining or restoring your health. All that you have thought of as nature or as the life forces in their healing and life maintaining processes, all that you have thought of as the healing power outside of yourself, all this is really your own subconscious, a part of yourself, though a part perhaps not recognized or realized by you up to this time. If through ignorance you have given these powers a wrong direction, you have now at your disposal and under your command a positive, upward, health-giving aggregate of forces. Finally, remember that your subconscious is always your friend. Once let it realize what is necessary for your physical well-being, once plant the right kind of seed ideas in its soil, and it will bend every energy within it toward manifesting and expressing health in you. Rightly understood and interpreted, the principles which we have just announced to you will make clear and plain to you that something in it, which you have always intuitively felt, might be found in mind cores, underlying their technical and sometimes fantastic theories and methods. You have here the stuff that does the work, which has been hidden in the various capsules offered you by the several schools, cults, and teachers. The verbal capsules serve to disguise the real stuff and to make it more attractive to the imagination. Any verbal form that appeals to the mental taste or to the imagination will serve the purpose. The highly exploited verbal formulas, the miraculous statements of truth, the wonder-working affirmations of the various schools, all these are but the verbal capsules in which are concealed the real stuff of auto-suggestion or suggestion. Anything that will arouse the mental state of active, confident expectation, or which will create a strong mental picture of the desired result or condition, will do the work. If you will analyze the various verbal formulas by means of which mind cures are made, you will always discover that auto-suggestion or suggestion abides at the very heart and center. The positive mental picture accompanied by the mental state of faith, confident expectation or expectant attention will give to the subconscious the desired mental pattern to be materialized into objective reality. And the aroused faith or confident expectation will set the machinery of the subconscious into activity. We note at the time of the present writing that a retired chemist of Nancy, France, is working miracles of healing in England. His formula is simply the continued repetition of the French words capace, meaning going, going, going. The patients are filled with the idea that their diseases are going, 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 and the repeated auto-suggestion produces the desired result in a great number of cases. The rapidly repeated French phrase sounding like pasa, 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 pasa constitutes the magic formula in this case. The additional statement to be repeated 20 times without stopping is every day in every way I'm getting better and better. If you have studied carefully what we have told you concerning the active principle of suggestion or auto-suggestion, you will discover the real stuff that does the work in this verbal formula that is obtaining such marked results according to the foreign press. The great virtue of this particular formula lies in its simplicity and its catchy sound. It supplies an attractive verbal capsule for the stuff that does the work, i.e. suggestion.